broken people. So let's just read from this first book of the Bible. We're in Genesis 12, verse 1. Just going to read three verses. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. So we start the most ambitious of preaching series I think uh, we've certainly that we've ever done 66 books of the Bible over 66 weeks of the year, one book at a time. And we have thrown the kitchen sink at it. So you will see on the table outside and on the website, Kings Community Church uk forward slash the Bible, you'll find uh, obviously the preaching, you'll find videos like that one, you'll find a Bible reading plan, you'll find Bible study notes, you'll find podcasts and hot off the press. These are fantastic. These are family workbooks, uh, a resource that you will not find online and it's available one per family if you have children and teenagers. I love Deuteronomy 6 where uh, God's people are told to repeat the commands that God has given them again and again to their children. And God says to them, talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you go to bed and when you get up. I love the fact that uh, in our experience as a family, it was talking to our teenagers on the road that we found the best time to talk to teenagers. Do you know why? Because they can't run away. They're locked in the car with you. So you can engage them in conversation. So can I encourage you as families, use this book. It is so, so good. Anyway, why are we doing this? What's the big idea? Well, there's a verse in Luke's Gospel where it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, that's Jesus, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the context for that verse is Jesus has just risen from the dead and he is appearing in one of his resurrection appearances to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And the disciples are confused and disheartened because their expectations of what it meant for Jesus to be king hadn't been fulfilled in the way that they thought they were going to be fulfilled. And they didn't anticipate that Jesus was going to die on a cross. And they had no idea at this stage that he'd actually risen from the dead. And so Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. And you've got to understand how he chooses to reveal himself. He chooses to reveal himself through a two-hour Bible study because they're on a seven-mile walk. And he's saying to them, you want to know what it is to encounter Jesus. You want to be my disciples, then I'm going to unpack the whole of the Bible to you from Genesis to Revelation. Did you know that from Genesis to Revelation, there are 490 specific prophetic revelations of Jesus? Right through the Old Testament, God is promising the king. And then the king comes and reveals himself in the New Testament. So over the next 18 months, the big idea is we want to encounter Jesus, don't we? Don't we want to be a people? Don't we want to be a church that encounters Jesus? And one of the prime ways that we encounter Jesus is Jesus reveals himself from Genesis to Revelation through the whole of Scripture. 
So of course, this morning, we're in the book of Genesis. And Genesis, as the video told us, is an incredibly important book to help us understand how the whole story fits together. I don't know what you're like when you read a novel. If I'm not grabbed on page one, I'm going to give up by probably page 10, actually. The first chapter is absolutely crucial for me. It's got to grab me from the word go. And Genesis, as the first chapter of the big story of the Bible, really does grab our attention. It gives us, first of all, a revelation of who God is. God is good and loving and powerful. He's the creator of the whole world. And he's a God who's wired for a relationship. It tells us who we are. Every human being is an image bearer of the God who made us. It tells us about our responsibilities in the world to care for God's beautiful world and to bring the authority of God across the world and to be fruitful. It tells us of the tragedy of sin entering into the world, about human beings as rebels against the God who made us and how we've turned our backs on God. And then it begins to unpack God's rescue plan. So as early as Genesis 3, we're told the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. There is someone coming who is going to defeat the power of the enemy. And of course, it's a book full of powerful stories. You've, I love the Genesis stories. You've got Jacob, the twisted, scheming little brother. You've got Joseph, prison to prime minister overnight. And so storytelling through the book of Genesis is a great way of communicating the truth and the big picture of the plan of God. And the passage that I read marks a new moment in the Genesis story. So Genesis 1 to 11 is the story of the whole world, really. And then ultimately, God in chapter 12 focuses and drills down his rescue plan, his showcasing of who he is to one man, to Abraham. I'm going to read the passage again. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make you famous and you'll be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. There's nothing particularly special about Abraham at the time that God calls him and reveals himself to Abraham. Abraham is an idol worshipper at that point. Uh, but God comes and he promises three things. He's going to make him a great nation. He's going to bless him. And that through Abraham, ultimately the whole world is going to be blessed. So first of all, he's going to make him a great nation. God's original plan, when you go back to the Garden of Eden, is uh, that he is going to fill the world with the descendants of Adam and Eve, people made in his image. And thereby, he is going to spread his glory right across the whole world. But of course, when sin enters into the world, that plan actually is hijacked by man's rebellion. And so the plan of God in Abraham is to focus one man and ultimately from him one nation to showcase the glory of God to all the other nations all around who are worshipping false gods. And of course, um, that is a unfolding message right through the Bible. When you get to uh, the New Testament, the Apostle Peter says, 
You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. But that verse, which was originally given to Israel, is now applied to Jew and to Gentile. So God showcases Israel and focuses Abraham and his descendants Israel. So ultimately the whole world would see his glory. And you get it right at the end of the picture in the book of Revelation, where there's a people from every tribe, every language, every nation. The big plan of God to show his glory to the whole world is finally achieved. But it starts with one man and a promise to Abraham that through him, there will be a nation emerged that reflected the glory of God. Second, God promises to bless Abraham. He promises things like uh, he's going to have many descendants. He's going to be wealthy. His descendants will have a beautiful land in which they're going to live. You see there, they are largely material blessings that God is promising Abraham. For us, as God's new covenant people, living in the promises of the New Testament in Jesus, the blessings are fulfilled in Christ. So Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, we've been blessed like Abraham with every spiritual blessing, but in Christ, says the Apostle Paul. So we are chosen, we are loved, we're blameless, we're holy, we're adopted, we're rescued, we're forgiven. Abraham, the promises are largely material. New Testament, the promises in Christ are, are essentially spiritual promises. And then the third promise, through Abraham, he is going to bless the whole world. This is, I think, the most important promise. And to understand this promise, you've got to go to the book of Galatians, Galatians 3, 16. It's not necessarily a particularly well-known verse, actually, but it is, I think, one of the most important and foundational verses, not just in the book of Galatians, but right across the New Testament. Paul is writing the book of Galatians to correct the idea that being biologically Jewish being descended from Abraham somehow gives you an inside track to God. And what he's teaching in this book is the only way to God is through Jesus and faith in him and what Jesus has done on the cross. And so he says in Galatians 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, male nor female, you're all one in Christ. God has created this new people of God, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, men and women. And Paul is crystal clear that the blessing of God to the whole world is promised through Abraham and his offspring. And some of the older translations, instead of using the word offspring, use the word seed. Or sometimes translators put it descendant or the child. And what Paul is saying, whether you use the word seed or offspring or descendant or child, it's singular, not plural. Listen to the verse. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say, Paul writes, and to offsprings, referring to many but instead referring to the one and to your offspring who is Christ. So when God makes a promise to Abraham, that promise that through his descendant or through his seed, the whole world is going to be blessed, that promise is fulfilled in Christ. Singular. Got that? 
God's promise to Abraham is renewed on several occasions. So we see in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is declared righteous or justified, made right with God on the basis of his faith in God. Abraham is not declared righteous on the basis of his works. Two chapters later, Abraham gets circumcised. But it's not circumcision or anything else Abraham does or doesn't do that makes him right before God. It's faith. We are made right with God through faith in Jesus. The promise of God is confirmed as well, of course, in Abraham's life through a miracle baby. Isaac is the miracle child. Sarah is long past menopause when she gives birth to Isaac. She's 90 years old. For her to conceive a child is biologically impossible. That in a small way points forward to Jesus, the ultimate miracle baby, born not of a postmenopausal woman, but born of a virgin. And then, of course, in Genesis 22, you've got the whole idea of God providing for himself a substitute. That Abraham takes Isaac and is commanded to sacrifice him. But God himself provides a substitute. He provides a lamb. God will provide for himself a lamb. Genesis 22 and verse 8. And Jesus is the true and better Isaac. Jesus is the substitute lamb. Jesus is the promise of a descendant who will bless and rescue the whole world. Abraham, sorry, is the promise of a descendant who will be the one who will bless and rescue the whole world. But interestingly enough, as we read through the Genesis story, we find it's full of surprises. I used to work when I was a student in Covent Garden. And I don't know whether you've ever been up to Covent Garden or some other place where there's lots of street entertainers. And I don't know whether you've ever watched a street magician do the old cup and ball trick. Anyone see that? Yeah, three cups and a ball. And the ball is never going to be in the cup that you think it's going to be in. Always by sleight of hand, it's somewhere different. And when you look at the Genesis story, the ball is never in the cup that you think it's going to be in. The promised child, God's Messiah, his anointed king, never comes from where you think he's going to come from. See, the promise is through Isaac, not through Ishmael, who was the first of Abraham's sons. The promise is through Jacob, who was the younger of Isaac's twins, not through Esau. Jacob is not only the younger son, he's also a liar and a cheat. The promise is through Judah and not through Reuben, who was the oldest of Jacob's sons, or Joseph, who was the oldest of Jacob's preferred wife, Rachel, and the son he most loved. Judah is actually the fourth son in the batting order. He's the one who comes up with the plot to sell his little brother Joseph into slavery. When you read the last chapters of the Genesis story, you think it's all about Joseph. So Genesis 37 to Genesis 50 is essentially the story of Joseph. He looks like the central character. We did a whole series pre-COVID, which we called Living the Dream on the Life of Joseph. And the story traces the journey from prisoner to prime minister overnight. And then right at the end of Genesis, the penultimate chapter, you get this verse. 
which is actually one of the most important verses in the whole book and arguably the whole Bible. Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. That means till tribute comes. And to him shall be the obedience of all peoples. See, this is Jacob on his deathbed blessing his 12 sons. And it is Judah by far and away that gets the biggest blessing. Because Jacob on his deathbed gets this prophetic revelation that a king is going to come from the line of Judah. A king is going to come and all the nations are going to worship this king. The king does not come from the line of Jacob's favoured son, Joseph. In fact, the whole Joseph story, Joseph is sold into slavery, he's taken into Egypt, he's given an influential position in Potiphar's house, he's then thrown into prison for a crime he doesn't commit, he then goes from prisoner to prime minister overnight, He's then used by God to save Egypt from a devastating famine. And then eventually the nations around Egypt. But here's the thing. All of that, all of that was that Joseph would save his family because Judah needed to be saved because it was from the line of Judah that Israel's kings would come. The scepter will not depart from Judah. King David is going to come from Judah's line. And ultimately from King David, Israel's greatest king, King Jesus, will come, who will not just rule Israel, but will rule all of the nations. And so Judah is the unlikely cup under which the ball is hidden or in our case, from which God's promised rescuer king is going to come. And Judah points us forward to an even more unlikely ball and cup. Points us forward, of course, to Jesus. Jesus, born of a virgin peasant teenager. We've just celebrated over Christmas. Born in a dirty, scruffy little town called Bethlehem born in occupied territory. The carpenter's son grew up in Nazareth. The one who befriended tax collectors, and prostitutes and lepers. The one who Isaiah describes as a man of sorrows, familiar with grief. The one who stood before Pontius Pilate and gave no defence. The one who died a criminal's death between two terrorists. He is on first sight the least likely cup under which the ball is found. But he is the descendant of Abraham who fulfills all the promises of God. He's there at the end of the Genesis story in Genesis 49 as the king who will come from the line of Judah. He's actually there at the end of the whole story. Because if we fast forward 66 weeks, we get to Revelation 5. All of heaven's worship is focused on the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered. He is the very focus of it all. Let's stand, shall we? Let's worship him. Jesus, we pray, come and fill our vision. Fill our gaze afresh with who you are. Hidden, obscure, but carrying all the promises, but now revealed in our hearts. Jesus, one day, the King who will rule every nation, the King to whom every knee will bow, 
We worship You this morning, King Jesus. Take Your place. Rule and reign in our lives, in Your church, and ultimately in the nations. Be glorified, King Jesus. Amen.